tribulation. Lord, what about this? Father, what about that? Lord, tell me about this. That would be incredible, wouldn't it? Because there's a lot of things we have trouble figuring out, right? There's a lot of questions we have. There's a lot of what ifs. There's a lot of things that, that we struggle with understanding. Uh, Jesus said that it was expedient that I go away. It's of the utmost importance that I leave so that He, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, could come. And when He comes, He's going to convict the world of their sins. He's going to teach us all things that we need to know at that time. He's going to help us through troubled waters. So I'm going to tell you something. You have the opportunity tonight to hear from God. See, what does a preacher do? The preacher just proclaims the Word of God. You know what? I'm, I'm just bold enough to say that I feel like I've heard from God about this lesson tonight. But see, the, what's going to happen to this lesson is up to you. I'm going to preach it. I'm prepared. I've studied. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've done my part. God's going to do His part. But you've got to ask yourself, do you really, really want to have a conversation with God? Amen. Let's get somebody to click the heat off or the air on. Yes, so the air is on. The air is on. on. Okay. So, uh, you know, we know that the, all the Bible was given by the inspiration of God. It's God breathed. That's God wanting to talk to you. That's the number one way God talks to you. God can speak to you through the preacher, through teachers, through uh, words of prophecy, through words of knowledge. God can speak to you through all those things. Let me tell you something. God is always and He never stops trying to talk to you. We crowd our mind with so many questions, so much garbage, so many other things that we cannot tune in to what God's saying. You know, sometimes I say things to people and I totally forget about it. I don't even remember saying it. Jonathan and I were talking the other day. He said, you remember what you told me when, when, when I met you at some church of God and we prayed those demons out of him or off of him, whatever there was. I was like five of them. They're like little monkeys attached to him. And they come off of him right down there in that altar. They didn't even know who I was. They just know some guy's dragging folks to the altar. And I'd get them in the balcony and we'd drag them down to their altar and we'd be praying for them. And a few of the brothers, well, he asked, he said, do you remember what you told me? I said, I don't, Jonathan. Um, I told him, I said, you're going to get this. And God's got big plans for you because if not, he wouldn't be wasting my time. Now, don't you think about it. I never say anything like I would never, I never say it. But look at Jonathan today. See, but Jonathan received that. And the question is today, are you going to receive what God is trying to tell you? So I want you to bow your heads and pray. After I pray, I want you to repeat these words. Father, Father teach me. Teach Father, me. Convict me. Father, convict me. Father, help me. Father, help me. Father break my ground. So that this seed, so that this seed can, bring forth fruit. can bring forth fruit. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name I, pray. I pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, so principle one, this is lesson two, the title of the lesson is Powerless. Principle one says, realize that I'm not God. How many people say, well, I know I'm not God. You act like God. You do things without asking God. You do things without consulting with God. You do things without getting some good advice or good counsel. So yeah, you know what I've been? I, I didn't realize I was not God. I made bad decisions because I made those decisions without consulting with the owner's manual. See, we got an owner's manual, right? The owner's manual is the Bible. I made decisions based on I was the God of my life and I done what I wanted to do. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life has become unmanageable. You know, as we go on with the Lord, we manage to control some things and we get a good hold of certain things as we go on. But there's always an area in our life that every one of us struggle with if we're being completely and totally honest. 
And it says in the, uh, Matthew 5, 3, Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. And we are. Without God, we're spiritually poor. We, without God, we are spiritually dead. We're not even alive. But well, with God, we become spiritually alive. And as our spirit man grows, our spirit man dominates our mind, and our mind leads us to more spiritual things, and our mind is fixed on spiritual things instead of earthly things. And in step one, it says, we admitted that we were powerless over addiction and compulsive behaviors, and that our lives have become unmanageable. Romans 7, 18 says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 8, I want you to follow me. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how long you've been around. I don't care how long you've been doing something in the church. Every person in here has a flesh that will lead them into trouble if they don't watch it. If we don't keep that flesh in check. I looked up the word powerless and it, man, it just rang home to me. Just, it says without the ability, without ability, influence, or power. Unable to overcome an adversary. I'm powerless. I remember one time I was spending the summer with my uncle. He was only a few years older than I was and at my grandmother's house. There's a lot, of, boy, I got a lot of stories about that. I was probably about nine years old, and this little boy was about 12, and he wanted to fight. And it was quickly ended up where I was on the ground, and he had his knee in my chest, and there was nothing I could do. I was 100% powerless against my adversary. Well, we have things like that in our life. It's being under the influence of a force that you do not have the ability to overcome. To be completely under the control of someone or something. You know it's bad. You want to quit, but you just can't quit. See, the first thing you have to say is you have to step out of the night. The first thing you have to do is you've got to stop lying about the problem. And number two is this. It's simple. You have to understand that without God, you are powerless to overcome your flesh. See, we want to hear from God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we want to hear from God. We hear from God from Genesis to Revelation. And if we will let that apply to our mind, renew our mind, our spirit man will dominate the flesh man. But it requires effort. It, it's not easy. It, we have to be uncomfortable. Sometimes when we watch our favorite TV show, we have to cut it off and listen to a sermon. Sometimes when we want to go out with friends, we know we shouldn't be hanging around. We have to stop. We have to stop. I remember uh, going, so I turned myself in in 2008 at the Hugo Black Building. They took me in a little holding cell. And then they took me and they... And I want you to look at those shackles. This is a cool story. Because I want you, they took me inside that little home so I could move around a little bit, but I was, I was in bondage, but I could move. They took me to the county jail and I could move around. Matter of fact, I preached a revival. Then they took me to a holdover in uh, Atlanta. But when they got ready to move me from Atlanta to Forest City, Arkansas, they shackled me. They shackled me. And I'm not talking about handcuffs. I'm talking about you got something around your feet and you can't move no more than this. And then they had a chain from your feet to your hand so you could barely raise your hands up like this. You could barely touch your face. And I was shackled. That was then that I realized that I was powerless, that I was not free, that I was owned, that I was owned by my sin. See, it wasn't the crime that sent me to prison. It was my rebellion not doing what God called me to do and sent me to prison. So I was shackled, shackled. Guys on long trips, a lot of times, they can't hold their bladder. You know what they do? They wet themselves on the way to prison. I've seen it happen time and time again. So there I was. I was shackled. I understood that in that experience that I was powerless. So you ask yourself, well, what am I powerless against? I want you to ask yourself that. What is it I'm powerless against? What is it 
that I would like to change about my life, that I've been trying to change about my life, but for some reason, I just am unable to change that particular thing. Is there a thought that you can't get out of your mind? It's something Daniel and I talk about all the time. <laughs> just something that rolls over and over and over and over your head. There's a way to stop it. That's why filling your mind with an alternative. Now, let me get you I want to give you false hope because changing your mind is a process that takes time. Is there someone who hurt you that you just cannot forgive? Anybody ever had that? Something that got you in bondage. Something you're powerless to stop. Is there a habit that you've tried to stop multiple times but could not stop? Is there something, something in your life that you're power, powerless with. I don't have the scripture up there. We're fixing to recap the Nile that Stephen done two weeks ago. And then, uh, but I want to read this one scripture out of the Passion Translation. I, I talk to uh, uh, Jonathan and Tony and Josh. We quote this scripture all the time. Romans 7, 15 out of the Passion Translation says, I am a mystery to myself. Man, that describes a lot of us. I know I don't want to do it, but I do it anyway. Anybody ever been there? I'm a mystery to myself. For I want to do what is right, but end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. So you're struggling. The first thing, way to overcome a struggle is step out of denial. The second thing is to admit that you're powerless against that thing so God can fix you from the inside out, not the outside in. Because outside in never lasts. Let me tell you how ultimate power is gained. Let me tell you how you stop being powerless in every area of your life. Y'all ready for this? You're no longer here. As long as you're in this flesh, you're going to be fighting. And you better <coughs> keep fighting. People, when is this going to be over? It's never going to be over. But I know that the way of the transgressor was hard. I know if I had the problems that I'm having right now, 20 years ago, it would have probably put me in the grave. I couldn't have stood it. But through Him, God has given me strength. He didn't take the battle away. He's given me strength to endure the battle. And as I'm pressing through, every time I get through one thing, I'm a little stronger because I had to get out of my comfort zone. And God just pressed and pressed and pressed. And every time I get through it, I'm a little stronger. Amen. So principle one, we realize that we're not God. We admit that we're powerless to control our tendencies to do the wrong thing and that our lives have become unmanageable. This can, this can apply to, to, to prescription drugs. This can apply to street drugs. This can apply to alcohol. This can apply to food. This can apply to spending. Come on. Yeah, it can apply to any area of your life that you cannot control. It can apply to hoarding. Anything that you know that is not right that you can't stop doing. So let's go over denial real quick. We've got four actions, but let's go over denial. What does denial do? In other words, you know you got a problem. You know it's a problem, but you just act like it's not there. How many people have ever done that? Ask my brother one day. I said, John, you've seen me in there working those car deals, swallowing 10, 15 lower tab at a time, going in the bathroom, doing all that stuff in there, coming back out, chewing up a half an Oxycontin, working 14, 15 hours a day. I said, what, didn't you know I was high? He said, yeah, I figured you was a little high. But during that time, you couldn't tell me anything. You couldn't tell me nothing. I was successful in the world's opinion. I was very successful. <clears throat> but I just denied it. And what it does, it disables our feelings. And as we keep denying it, the pressure turns into anxiety. 
See, when we got an area in our life and we belong to God, that God wants you to overcome. Now, if you don't belong to God, you can probably get by with a little something. But if you have given your heart to God, God is going to press you with a word called conviction. And if you don't repent over that sin, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And the next thing you know, you're going to be so bound with anxiety that you just can't, you, you can't function. Right. So it's lost energy. How many people have ever had a day where you didn't do a whole lot, but at the end of the day, you just were wore out, just don't kind of stop. Just stop. Every time you answer the phone, every time you turn around, pressure, pressure, pressure. You're like, man, I'm just mentally wore out. I promise you, I could go to a car lot and work at car deals for six hours and do a good and working car deals and go do manual labor for 14 hours and be more tired on kind of the mental stress than it's if I went out here and hold it block for 14 hours. And the gates grow. You can't get nowhere till you step out of denial. You're stuck. You're stuck until you say, until you admit it. It isolates you from God. Remember, God is like, let me tell you, darkness is always there. Y'all know that, right? Darkness is always there. All you got to do is cut off the light. When you accept a sin in your life as it being okay, you're cutting the light of God off. And darkness is always there. It's just waiting on you to cut off the light. But an eye denial isolates you from God. It alienates you from the relationships you need. I, I, you know what? And I, we've done this man for a long time, and I can I know. I don't hear from them for a couple weeks. I know they've fallen off the rails. I just start watching their Facebook. Next thing you know, they're posting something stupid because out of the abundance of the heart, people post. Or they, they talk or whatever they do. You can watch them. They just get off the rails. It ain't, I want to help them. I want to reel them back in. I do what I can. Well, what they do is, is if they are in denial and God's trying to bring, they split you apart from the very people that can help you overcome the sin that you're struggling with. Amen. The other thing it does, boy, it lengthens the pain. Lengthens the pain. Something you, if you just go ahead and confess it and throw it out there, deal with it and get it over, something that you could overcome in a week, it's a cold new bondage for years causing you Pain. My denial was extreme. Here I'm, I'm working 12, 13 hours a day. I've had, from the world standpoint, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month. How is it kind? Just blasting. So I was in, as long as I had plenty of money and had everything the world had to offer, but what happened? But lust, when it is conceived, bring it for sin. And sin, when it is finished, bring it for death. You say, well, Ron, you're still alive. My marriage isn't still alive. The things that I had isn't still alive. All the work that I worked for, the enemy come in and he stole, he killed, and he destroyed everything in my life. Because I would not accept and throw my hands up and say, God, I need help. I did, though. May the 27th, 2007, when the Fed showed up, I said, ah, okay, I got it. Come on. <clears throat> then we got the whole process. What has to happen is the pain has to outweigh your fear. Did you hear what I said? The pain of your sin has to get to the point where it outweighs your fear of change. You know, I'll never forget talking to Marty. I, I was it t 10 years ago, eight years ago, seven years ago, and I'm on the phone with Marty. I'm talking to him, and we're going through it. He said, man, I don't want to go through the withdrawals. I don't want to go through the withdrawals. I said, well, just sit there and shove that crap in your arm till you're dead. He doesn't want to change. He didn't want to get help. Why? Because you're afraid. But eventually God is going to bring you to a place that the pain is going to override your fear. Come on. Yeah. Stop 
playing God. You just got to stop playing God. Matthew 6, 24 says that uh, you can't serve two masters. You're going to love the one and hate the other. You can't serve God and money or God and mammon or God and wealth. You, you can't teeter-tot on this thing. This is not, well, I'm going to be 90% okay. If you're 90% okay, that 10% that you're not giving God creates havoc in your life. It's all or nothing with God. He said, well, I'm struggling. That's okay. Just say you're struggling and you're all in. What I'm talking about is when you're struggling and you deny that it's a struggle. Come on. Let me, if, I, if I took two bowls of soup, two bowls of soup, and I took one grain of fly poop and put it in one bowl of soup, and I put one grain of pepper in the other bowl of soup, which one are you going to eat? The one with the pepper, Right? It doesn't take but just a speck to contaminate the whole thing. It's all or nothing. That's what I'm telling you. It's all or nothing. And if you'll get all in, if you'll dedicate your life, if you'll get all in, God will restore everything that the enemy has stolen. Amen. So you've got to stop playing God. Number three, you've got to start admitting. We got, I am powerless. I cannot control this. I can't, I'm a, I am just under the influence of this thing that I cannot control. How many men like to say that? You would tell you why these guys are up in the altar every Sunday crying their eyes out. Because somehow I've taught them to throw their hand up and say, I'm struggling. I need help. A prayer meeting's in a gym. Go figure that out. People crying and pouring their heart out. Why? Let me tell you, these young men ain't different. They don't have more trouble than the church down the road has. The difference is, is these young men have been taught to throw their head up and say, I've got a something in my life that I'm struggling with and I need help. Mm -hmm. I can't do nothing until you do that. Because with man, this is impossible with God. All things are possible. Start admitting that our lives have become unmanageable. Psalms 40 and 12 says problems far too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. Meanwhile, my sins, too many to count, have all caught up with me and I am ashamed to look up. Man, I was ashamed. I remember, uh, I, don't, I don't mind working, I don't, don't care. Cleaning toilets, I, I just like to work. And when I got that job at Nikki's restaurant, I didn't mind busting tables. I enjoyed it. I, man, it was it was interesting. Loading them tables up, talking to the customers, and they even give me the latitude to pray with customers. But here I am, I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the 30, 40, 50000 dollars a month car guy. One of the highest paid car guys, not in the city, not in Alabama, but in the nation. I'm making Mega, mega bucks. This is 2005, 6, and 7. But now here I am. I realized my sin. I had done my time. And those same guys that were begging me for jobs two years ago, I was picking up their dirty dishes. Man, that's realizing something. That's your sin coming home. That's your sin coming home. So we got these acrostics. We're going to go over these real quick. So let me get somebody to help me hand, hand these out. She's a lot better looking than the other usher. <laughs> So we got an acrostic on powerless. So we're going to go through them one at a time. I want you to fill them out. I want you to keep these with you. And, uh, <clears throat> if, if you really want the Word of God to change you, you always bring something to write with. But I got messages from two years ago in the notes of my tablet. Why? Wow, because I need to get it. Because I, I realized I messed up and only God's Word can change me. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and get rolling. Pride is the first thing. So we got power less, and the first letter is P. The first letter tonight's acrostic is P. We start to see 
that we no longer are trapped by our pride. Because pride is the very basis of sin, is it not? Right. Every sin stems from pride. Matter of fact, I'll tell you this, love is not the opposite of hate. And hate is not the opposite of love. Let me tell you what the opposite of love is. The opposite of love is pride. That's good. The only is. Man, we can get hung up in this because I, I know some folks that's got some bad stories. I know some people that I'm thinking, well, I understand why you're doing what you're doing. But we can't get stuck in the only ills. Only if they hadn't walked out. Only if they had only if I'd stopped drinking. Only if this, only if that. So when we admit we're powerless, we step out of the only ills. I mean, you can't change how you started your life. Listen to me real quick. You cannot change how your story started. But from today, you can change how your story ends. But the first thing you got to do is step out of denial. Then you got to admit your powers. So it's P-O-W. Worry. Worry. It says in Matthew 6, 34, Don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of you tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. Let me, the bottom line is 90% of everything you worry about never happens. Did y'all hear what I said? You got 10 things you're worried about. They're consuming all your time. And nine of those 10 things never come about. Matter of fact, I, will, I don't want you to do this, but if you're going to write down your worries, you can write them all down. And then look and see if they ever come around. See what happens. Escape. The next thing that happens when we admit we are powerless is that we quit trying to escape. You know, we, we don't want to face it. We don't want to face our decisions. We don't want to face the consequences. So we try to delay it. But when you admit you're powerless and understand that only God can help you, then you stop trying to escape. Resentment. Boy, we deal with this one a lot, don't we? The R in powerless stands for resentment. If they, if they are suppressed and allowed to fester, resentments can act like an emotional cancer. Did you hear what I said? If those resentments if you allow that person to hurt you, to continue to control you, you're going to end up being the worst kind of addict. That's right. Worse than a heroin addict. Worse than an ice addict. Worse than an opium addict. Worse than any addict. You're going to be a bitter addict. You're going to be addicted to bitterness and strife and drama and calamity. And every time you look around, you're not looking for the good in people. You're looking for people to hurt you because you never could let go of the last person that hurt you. And worse than that, you never can forgive yourself. Loneliness, that's the L in powerless. When you admit that you are powerless and start to face reality, you find that you do not have to be alone. See, Satan wants to isolate you, isolate you, isolate you. I love watching these, uh, these uh, Africans, you know, safari hunts. It, it just intrigues me at the way the hyenas and the, and the wild dogs and the lions hunt. They don't go after the biggest and the strongest one. They go after the babies. They go after the ones that just come to Christ. And what they do is they catch them when they're not in church. They catch them when they're not in fellowship. They isolate that baby. They isolate that weak one. They isolate that spiritually sick one. And they jump on you. The good, great thing about Short Creek is we don't judge you no matter where you're at. We just love you. We understand that it's not our job to judge you where you're at. It's our job to love you where you're at. Let the Holy Spirit do His job. And we do ours. We just love so you don't have to be lonely. You can find somebody you can confide in and confess everything to you. Then E stands for emptiness. As long as you're in denial and thinking that somehow you got the power to overcome this, you get empty. Empty. 
empty. But when you admit it, you give up that emptiness. When you finally admit that you're truly powerless by yourself, that empty feeling deep inside, that cold wind that blows, that deep, dark feeling begins to fill up with the Spirit of God. Let me tell you what your Christian brothers and sisters have. They have a God that has taken up residence in them. They have become the residence of God. And when you fellowship with other believers that really know how to love, that emptiness begins to fill. Is that true, Rebecca? It just fill up. You can feel the love. You can feel it. So you don't have to be empty anymore. The first S stands for selfishness. I have known people that have come into recovery thinking that the Lord's prayer was our Father who art in heaven. Give me, give me, give me. Come on. Our Father who art in heaven, I need you to fix everything in my life so I can be happy. That's, right. that's pride, that's selfish, and it does not operate inside the kingdom of God. It operates in the kingdom of darkness. Let me tell you, I tell them, it's like Alan says, man, I just can't wait to get to the jail every week. It's changed my life. He's not being ministered to. He's going in there to minister. And why is it changing? Because freedom is found through service. When you serve somebody, God can heal you. But as long as you're unwilling to serve, as long as you're unwilling to sacrifice, you're going to stay stuck and never find freedom. The last S is, Rachel comes on up, is separation. The last thing that we give up when we admit that we are powerless is separation. Some people talk about finding God. God's never been lost. Separation from God can feel real. Especially if you've ever had a close relationship with Him and you let sin inch in and separate you from God. It's a real thing. I'm going to read this prayer over you. And then she's going to sing. And if you want prayer, everyone please stand. And if you're able to stand, if you're not, that's okay. If you're able to stand, I want you to stand. I'm going to read this prayer. And she's going to sing a song. And if you want prayer, I want you to come and kneel at the altar. If you're able to, if you want us to lay hands on you, come up front. Dear God, your word tells me that I cannot heal my hurts, I cannot heal my hang-ups, and I cannot overcome my habits by just saying that they are not there. Help me, parts of my life or all of my life are out of control. I now know that I cannot fix myself. Let me interject something here. You can't fix other people. It seems the harder that I try to do the right thing, the more I struggle. I want to step out of my denial into the truth. I want to step out of the darkness into the light. I see the light, and Lord, I want to press toward the light and get out of darkness so you can reveal everything that's in me that I need to repent over so I can live in freedom. I pray for you to show me the way. In your son's name, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all just, you want to come up and pray. These altars are going to be open as she begins to sing.